Okay, everyone, let's get started, please. Mm. So uh, thank you everyone for being here today. So this is uh, the second event in our hopefully monthly seminar series on the Indian economy. And we're delighted to be hosting Pooja Mehra, who is the author of The Lost Decade, and we'll be discussing her book today. Um, so this is actually a, a fantastic way of having a second event because at CPR typically we haven't done much on the macro economy and Pooja has written perhaps one of the most accessible books on India's macro in the last decade, partly because it doesn't have a singular graph or regression in it and yet it is a thoroughly interesting narrative. And so uh, I have to give her full credit for that. Uh, it also reads a lot like, um, if any of you have read Too Big to Fla Fail, this fly on the wall account of what is happening at the RBI, what is happening at the Ministry of Finance. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Roy and Mr. Desai will tell us much more about it. But it's a, really a pleasure to try to you know, sniff out what's happening in the corridors of power and feel like you're part of it for a little while. And so hopefully all of you will read this book in some time. Um, and so before, um, so the way today will work is that first we'll have some comments on the book from Mr. Desai and Dr. Roy. And then um, I will ask Pooja a set of questions for about 15, 20 minutes about her motivations behind the book, how the book came into being, some of the ideas in the book. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, we're hoping that a few more people will stream in because Pooja does have a major fan following on Twitter and otherwise. Um, and so um, let me introduce our, our author and our panelists today. Um, so obviously, if any of you read economic news generally, you know who Pooja is, but Pooja is an economic journalist who's been in this space for almost two decades at this point. Uh, she's worked at various leading publications covering government, um, but most notably was probably the economics editor at The Hindu for some time. Um, in 2008 and 2009, she won the Ramnath Goenka Awards for her reporting on the global financial crisis, and I, this is when I started reading her quite regularly, admittedly. And in many ways, The Lost Decade is a continuation of her award-winning work. Basically, it picks off at that point and figures out what's happened in India since then. And so it's kind of a, a nice follow-up to her award-winning work. Um, commenting on Pooja's book today, we have two very distinguished panelists. So we have Mr. Nitin Desai, who is an economist, an international civil servant, and he's had stints both at the Planning Commission and the Ministry of Finance, most notably as the chief economic advisor in the late 1980s. Um, after that, he had another career at the U in the UN system as Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs between 92 and 2003. Uh, he still sits on multiple boards, including that of the Shakti Foundation, and contributes regularly to Business Standard. Um, we also have the pleasure of having Dr. Ratan Roy, who has been the director of NIPFP since 2013. Uh, prior to joining NIPFP, he was also an economic diplomat and had a long career with UNDP. Uh, and he has been and continues to be a member of many government commissions, task force, uh, including the 7th Central Pay Commission. He's been an advisor to the 13th and 14th Finance Commissions. Um, and he is also a regular contributor to many media outlets. And so I think a subscription to Business Standard is justified just by the writing of these two people over here and Pooja's former writing as well. Um, so uh, I will stop there. I will hand it over to Mr. Desai for some of his, um, about 10, 15 minutes of comments on the book. Then Dr. Roy will make his comments and then I'll have a conversation with Pooja about the book after which we'll open it up. Uh, so please, no comments until kind of <coughs> the very end of the 45 minutes of a conversation we have here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very glad I am uh, agreed to do this because I have read the book, Puja, and I must say I enjoyed it enormously because it told me many things which I did not know of. Please remember, I'm not, I have been a policy outsider for the past 30 years. Okay. So all this is new, much of this was uh, news to me because I really did not know much about uh, what, was the, what was the inside story we are many of the things that we had observed from outside as commentators, as citizens, or, or whatever. And uh, yes, it is a book where you have described this decade as a lost decade, and uh, I suppose let us focus on that. A strong part of the, your argument that it's a lost decade is the absence of deep-seated reforms during this uh, period. Uh, my central thesis is going to be that uh, my central thesis is going to be very, perhaps very similar to what Ratin would say later. 
that our problem today is uh, much deeper, more structural, and not just a matter of doing this or that reform. And uh, so let me focus just on that. The, you know, he, uh, we were just told that uh, Puja's book has no uh, diagrams, no graphs. Uh, I'm going to make up for it. Uh, <laughs> and I'm afraid you'll all have to have good eyesight. Hmm? You'll have to have very good eyesight because I have, I'm not a PowerPoint man, so I just do these things. Yeah. And no, no, it's okay, I'll hold it. Now, you know, look at this graph. In many ways, you know, it starts. <laughs> in many ways, it reflects the pattern of growth which she talks about. You have a period, low growth, then it rises up during the 2004 2008 period. Uh, you know, very sharply, then you get the drop to 2009 to 2012, a bit of a recovery, and then again a decline. Uh, this is a graph which almost reflects the pattern. But the reason I'm showing you this graph is, it's actually a graph of the growth in sales of fast-moving consumer goods. It's not a graph of growth at all. It's a, group, it's, a, it's a graph of the growth in sales of fast-moving consumer goods, which is what is bought by people at the bottom of the uh, pyramid. Uh, you know, Latin has also been talking about the structural issue of uh, plateauing of consumption by the, if you like, the people who have discretionary money to spend. And in some ways, this graph of motor vehicle sales reflects that and shows how the growth rate of motor vehicle sales has started coming down, and we are now talking in terms of negative growth. And I take this as a starting point because my argument is that you cannot great, uh, you know, supply growth unless you have demand growth. It's just not possible. And that the core reason why we are not getting demand growth is because we have not addressed this issue of uh, what is happening at the base of the income pyramid. Let me give you two more graphs. This is a graph of employment growth, okay? Uh, this is the graph of employment growth, and you'll see the pattern. The pattern is pretty steady employment growth to say roughly 2011, 12, and then down, except there's a little peak in one year. No, it's probably statistical for all I know. This is what happens, the absence of employment growth after 2011, 2012. And this is now being demonstrated by the NSS uh, uh, stuff which has come about. Though there are disputes between people, today's paper contains three different estimates. Uh, one, two of them say employment has fallen, and one of them, Lavish Bhandari, says it has risen, but not by much. Or whatever it is, the fact is that uh, the, these, incidentally, let me just explain a little where these numbers come from, because it's a source of data which I think researchers should use more. It's called the CLEMS database, K-L-E-M-S. K for uh, you know, capital, L for labor, E for energy, M for material, S for uh, services. This is a database which uh, tries to put together in a coherent way information about 27 sectors on capital, labor, energy use, material use, and this. And of course, it has a lot of other stuff uh, on this. And it is economy-wide. It's an economy-wide, and it's done every year. They update it. The latest one, for the one available in 2019, takes a story up to 2016-17, from 80-81 to 2016-17. The advantage of this, it's a coherent and consistent database where the different things fit together. So if you take a number from there on the share of labor, it will fit in with the information about profits, about wages, and so on. You know, this is its great advantage. Uh, incidentally, I wanted to play a little bit of Narad Bunigiri and uh, just tell you about the differences. You know, we have, we've had this controversy about GDP growth rates and about uh, what was done by Sudipta Mandal's committee, what was later revised by the CSO. Now, in some ways, this CLEMS database is more reliable because it is consistent with details. It is consistent with sectoral details. It is consistent with the share details, all sorts of things. You know? That you can't say this is wrong without seeing at least 50 other things are also wrong. Now, what does that database show? That database basically shows 
a number which is somewhere in between the Mandel number and the CSO number. And of course, the difference in the CSO's case, vis a the claims, I'm not talking Mandel, is that the CSO numbers in the pre-2014 are always negative, much below claims, and after that are much above claims. And one very important one, which I would like to point out, is the CSO claim 7.9 or nearly 8% growth in the demonetization year, 2016-17. Then the same year, the claims database is 1% lower. You know? So I just thought I'd throw this little bit of Naran Munigiri into the works for the time being. Uh, the, let me get back to this. Now, it's not just that. You can use that same database for looking at earnings growth. And this is what the earnings growth shows in terms of uh, the earnings per person, la you know, labor earnings. Now, it, as you can see, here too, you have the same pattern. You have the same pattern. The, the blue line is for manufacturing. The orange line is for services. And you'll see the same pattern, growth which goes on till a certain time, let's say roughly, and then sta it stabilizes. It goes up and then stabilizes. The peak in the services case here is the sixth pay commission. You know, in the 2008 nine, that's just a okay, uh, peak simply because of the pay commission. So basically, we've had a situation where at least as far as per people who work in manufacturing and services are concerned, you had a good period, a high growth period, a high FMCG growth period that I was speaking of coincides with the case where employment was growing, wages were increasing. You know, if you see the same thing in agriculture, you can, sorry for troubling with so many graphs, but you know, I, I, it's easier than, than reciting numbers. This is a graph of agricultural wages growth, you know, uh, which has been done. And as you can see, relatively stagnant till about, almost till about uh, 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 end of 2006. Then it booms up. It really shoots up. And then again, it starts falling sharply. And this high growth period basically again coincides with the high FMCG growth thing that I was showing you earlier. And I could add to this one more thing that is worth mentioning here is the terms of trade of agriculture. These are the terms of trade of agriculture. And there too you will see that when you look at farmers versus non farmers, you will see it rising up to say roughly 2010 and then falling afterwards. The central point I'm trying to make is that basically we are suffering from a deficiency of income growth at the base of the income pyramid. And that this is leading to the type of demand stagna growth stagnation which is holding back investments. The government unfortunately is focusing its attention almost entirely on the corporate sector. You know, corporate tax reform, this reform, that now they're talking in terms of various concessions which will uh, assist uh, shareholders and things of this sort. But that's not where the problem is. Our corporations are sitting on 800,000 crores of cash that they put into mutual funds. And the reason they are not investing is because they don't see potential for invest, uh, uh, you know, uh, demand growth and the capacity utilization is coming down. If you want to change things, you change things at that base of the uh, b b pyramid. Without that, you're not going to get that change. In fact, also worry about the non-corporate sector. The small industries and agriculture, they, between them, they account for roughly 50% of GDP. If you look at the investment numbers and the households, and remember in our case, when we say household savings and household investment, it includes all non-corporate enterprises small industries, farms, everything is included in this category. Almost the entire fall in savings and investment that we have seen over the past five years is because of a fall in household savings and investment. We just had recently, we had the data which came from, you know, the, it was, came out literally a few days ago uh, on the, uh, in, in, in fact, the savings rate of households between 2011-12 and 17-18 fell from uh, around 25 percent to around uh, nearly 18, 18 or 19 percent. I think. One second, I'll just I have the number somewhere here. 
also your rate is, from 25% to 18%. I'm rounding it off. And their investment, gross capital formation by households, fell from, what, 20% to 13%. This is the problem, that basically there is a phenomenal stagnation outside the corporate sector, which we have to recognize. And you see this in the dramatic decline in household savings and what we call household savings and household investments. In fact, I would argue that the litmus test of recovery in India is whether this recovers or not. If this does not recover, then basically I cannot say the economy has recovered. Now, I focused on the bottom of the pyramid. There are other things that I could focus on. Exports, for instance. Exports is an exogenous source of demand growth. And this is an area where, again, we did very well. In the export growth during that period, in the high growth period, was pretty good. And it's only later that we've had complete stagnation. Uh, uh, yeah. So you see the boom in the dollar value of exports, and then down again. You know. And it's partly reflected in the exchange rates and so on. And uh, we have seen this also in the internet. It, uh, the dollar value of India's exports has remained virtually stagnant for the past seven years. The dollar value. It's virtually stagnant. 2018, 19, there was a bit of an increase. But we are again getting into uh, difficult waters now. And the final thing I would mention is that some of the policy initiatives of the government were, to put it mildly, disastrous. And here is a graph. Now, this is an interesting graph. It's a graph of the index of industrial production. It's a graph of the index of industrial production which separates capital-intensive and labor-intensive industries in a very broad two-digit fashion, not a very detailed one. And if you see, there will, uh, GST is here, demonetization is about here. And you can see clearly that post-demonetization, post-GST, there's a dramatic decline into negative territory of labor-intensive industries, while the other one continues uh, going up. And of course, the average will be close to, it will be pretty low because this is going down. But the difference between the impact on the labor intensive industries and the capital intensive ones, and the same thing you, know, you will see is in exports. The same pattern of in, uh, the exports of labor intensives going down, of the other ones going up. I'm, I have troubled you with all this stuff because I think this is an argument which is not registering in the minds of the public as yet. They much of the economic commentariat focuses on reform this, reform this, reform this. Now, for instance, everybody keeps talking about labor reform. And the, what I'm saying here, the labor reform I need is not what people, ease of hiring and firing. The labor reform I need is better working and wage conditions for people at the bottom of the wage pyramid. That is what I need. What I would like to see is a narrowing of the differentials between uh, the so-called organized workers and so-called unorganized workers. And somewhere else I've argued that we would uh, try and eliminate this difference because this difference simply perpetuates the incentive to remain small. You know? uh, why do you want to do that? Make, you know, Brazil, for instance, has a requirement even if you employ one person, that person must be given an employment card. That's it. You have to give an employment card to anybody you employ. Ratim will know about this. He was in Brazil for a long time. And uh, they, in Brazil, you have to give that employment card. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter how, how many people you employ. So can't we at least introduce that? Into, you domestic. You see, everybody, anybody you employ, you have to give a domestic, uh, an employment card. Now, this is the sort of thing we should do. Narrow this difference, eliminate this difference between so-called unorganized and so-called organized, at least as far as things like uh, labor regulation or environmental regulation uh, are, are concerned. And that is the reason why I'm stressing this. Yes, we need reform. But the reforms we need are those which will improve the income growth potential at the bottom of the pyramid which will not create incentives for people to remain small, 
Uh, that, and we should, of course, also be highly export promoting. High growth without exports is not possible. And that is basically the message of reform. Focus the reforms on income growth at the bottom, on export growth, and on eliminating differentials between uh, small and large, and don't spend so much of your resources on giving incentives to the corporate sector prematurely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, CPR, for inviting me. It's a real delight to uh, be here since uh, this uh, idea that Puja would write this book, I think, was a year and a half, two years old. And I was privileged that uh, she actually said she wanted to come and see me. And we had lunch together and we discussed it. And uh, so, uh, so, in a sense, I watched this being conceived and I was, I was involved in the birthing. I did read the first draft. Uh, so I think, uh, I've always said that I think what we have in Puja, the best thing that happened to Puja was that she gave up reporting. Because I think in my lifetime I have not seen, uh, and I'm pretty old now, <laughs> the younger people here, someone who I can genuinely say is going to be, if not already, the Martin Wolf of, and I've said this frequently, of India's economic journalism landscape, which is a step above. He said I wrote or I commented on persons or I commented on, you know, events. I commented on policies and I used analytics to form a judgment on policy that's been lacking in the mean, uh, in a consistent way. And I'd say your strike rate of nine out of 10 is better than Martin Wolf, <laughs> so more power to you. And I think this book is interesting for that reason because this, uh, in a sense, I have the privilege of knowing your trajectory marks, I think, Puja's journey also uh, from being a, you know, a hardcore reporter well respected in the corridors of the Ministry of Finance when she was there. Uh, and I certainly, when I was the Finance Commission, was terrified of her because, uh, you know, one thing we normally do with reporters, at least in the Finance Commission, KP knows better about the ministry, is if they ask you a question, say, sure, here's a thousand pages of data. Yeah. I know there are deadlines. She would actually take it and do something with it, which was very scary. So after that, I began avoiding her. And no questions, you know, like, give me paper give me information. Uh, so that was a reporter's reporter with analytical capabilities. And then when she became a columnist and began to start writing about the economy, I was very, very excited about the book because it actually reflects, therefore, three things, I think, uh, which I'll comment on in my remaining 12 minutes. One, an economic history of a very odd phenomenon, not of the Indian economy. Why do I say that? Look at this cover. I have to explain this repeatedly to this government. I was not here with the previous government. I'm sure I would have to them to. Government is not the economy. Government is national security. Government is foreign policy. Government is Griham and sure. Finance ministry is not the Indian economy. But look at the cover of this book. So the story of the Indian economy, and this is the first chronicle of record, even as late as 14 years after liberalization, that's when I got out of book, is essentially a story of economic statecraft and its failures uh, in terms of the Indian state continuing to try and run a capable macroeconomic policy. And therefore, every single chapter in the book is, uh, it is rich with references to how people react to the state, and therefore, I think it's an accurate depiction of the times we live in. But every single chapter in this book is about the state and how it reacted to economic events. And this is a remarkable chronicle for that reason. Because it also shows consistency. Uh, contrary to what some believe, there is no plus ça change after the new regime came into power. It continues to be the case that the state regards itself as the major maker or breaker of the economy. So do commentators who blame the state when the economy goes well and congratulate it when it goes badly. Right? And then people fall in line around that constellation and uh, what you get is a chronicle of the state's ability essentially not to do things that economists regard as successful or unsuccessful in an economy, Nitin was referring to these, to unlock opportunities, to promote demand, to make sure that there is supply response adequate to demand. That is not the story that I read in Puja's book and that is why it's a telling narrative. It's a telling narrative of a first-class economic historian. 
for what it does not see. That's very important for the students here. These, these silences are important. It is not talking about these things, and none of the protagonists in her book speak of these things, except in passing. So what they speak about is institutional architecture and furniture, monetary policy committee, FSLRC. These are essential steps in getting an economy right, but that it is not the economy, right? And the failures too, in the breach, are mentioned by uh, in the context of the state's ability or inability to respond to economic challenges given the apparatus at its command. So I think the important narrative that runs through your book, which I have not seen commented on any review, and I think is very, very significant, because time and again now that we are, and I'm very grateful to Ritin for his kind words, I did see it first, so I'll take full credit for that, I'm not unnaturally modest. Uh, we are in the middle of a very serious structural slowdown, but both protagonists and opponents of the government continue to look at the government as if it is going to make or break the slowdown. It's much worse than that, I'm afraid. It's much worse than that. It has to do with structures and demand composition, agricultural wages, and these things will necessarily involve action on more and broader fronts in government if it's going to work. The second theme I get out of uh, the book is that uh, India remains, despite our best efforts, uh, a country which is caught in a bind I've mentioned before, that for everyone sitting in this room, I think more or less, we are living broadly in an unrationed economy. Rationing does not affect our lives. If you have money in your pocket, if you can't buy something, you guys here, it's, it's not because it's rationed, it's because you don't have money. So tomorrow you'll have money, you'll buy it. It was not always the case. When I was a kid, if I had money in my pocket, I couldn't buy a Bajaj scooter. I could have the money, I couldn't buy the scooter. If I wanted to buy a bottle of black label, I couldn't. There was no black label in the market, couldn't buy. Have money, can't buy. Okay. Railway ticket also, if I wanted to go to Bombay overnight to meet my girlfriend, can't buy. You know? But today you guys are not in that situation, I'm not in that situation. But it remains the case, and I'll be brief here because I've written about it elsewhere, that the majority of the country continues to be a situation where the stuff they want is rationed. Whether it is health, or it is education, or it is gas cylinders, or it is... And so what I see in Pooja's book is a very interesting contrast when you talk about the politics cross-regime. I see Modi struggling and giving up on this essential truth, and I'm not blaming any government, but what I'm going to say is a consequence of our growth path, that for the majority of this country, boss, things are still rationed. And whether it is, not jobs, they are in a sense with Narega, because Narega, remember, is a failure. Nobody in this country should not have a Narega income if they cannot find a Narega job, says the Act. And the Act is an abject failure, no one talks about it. Now we only say, oh, so many people got jobs in Narega. Hey, the people who wanted jobs they didn't get it are supposed to get paid. Uh, that is Indian state. But the fact remains that jobs are rationed. And what are the most desirable jobs in this country, which is the subject of this book, that are rationed by means of competitive exam? All public sector jobs. Okay. The most aspired for jobs, and I discovered the pay commission, probably the unhappiest people in India are in the Indian public sector. So it's a paradox because once you pass that exam and get a job, it is essentially entitlement. You may or may not do the job, but it's an entitlement. And I understand this. I was born in rationing society. You, if you wanted to play the game here, it was a good job to get. So that system essentially still continues to administer rationing, and the expectations from it are to deliver more than rationing. And when I see the conflicts you describe, not outside the verified domains of macro policy, that's very easy. But when we are talking about the implications of Narega, when we are talking about, you know, how uh, both Pranam Mukherjee and Chidambaram try and respond to line departments, the narrative I'm getting is one that, oh, this is all very well, this is what a good economy should function like, but my daily day bread to butter is I have to ration. I have to ration jobs, I have to ration cylinders, I have to ration Narega, I have to ration the entire planning commission, Tamasha. And therefore, in a sense, if you, if you accept my premise, and I'm not going to go further because Pooja told me to be more than usually cautious, which is not difficult, um, to speculate that this government is still beset with the problem of rationing, then absent the Finan Planning Commission as a major rationing instrument at the state level in the old days, I would ask you to reflect on how it does this rationing. The third and final, I think, interesting thing this book tells us, which is a very positive message, is the huge resilience of both the economy and a fairly ramshackle and outdated, because it is rationally oriented, economic administration. There's a reason for it. When people say India's economic administration is outdated, my argument is that 
there must be a logic to this because nobody would willfully sit and run an outdated, you know, economic system on note sheets. You would modernize it. Eventually you would modernize it. So there must be some reasons. If you take out the bad reasons, the real reason is that the current system that we have is perfectly fit for purpose for rational. And I had a quote from, in fact, in one of Puja's books. So the rest of it can take time. And that is important. And perhaps that because the rest of it can take time, the statecraft is not bad. There's a quote which I did dog bark anyway, it's somewhere here, from her book, where they're trying to set up the Monetary Policy Committee. And Finance Minister Jaitley has come into office. And the bureaucrat, I don't know who it was, says, sir, there is plenty of time. And then, of course, Puja goes on to say, no, no. You know, Jaitley says, if the two people in the past have looked at it, I'm going to implement it, that is good. I read something else there. There is plenty of time for that. There is always plenty of time for institutions. But there is very little time when it comes to the urgent political rub of rationing. And what, what it shows me this book is very interesting for me as an outsider, that how the real priorities of the finance ministry are affected by this tension between the need to deal with rationing, and even if it's a central government which only does it at a high level, e.g. to the planning commission, the need to be seen to do something about it. They need to claim credit for it, because you cannot claim credit for having run defense, internal security, and railways well at the central government level, pass laws, change institutions, and go to the ballot box. You may, I don't know. It's not been tested. So that also comes out in this book, I think, this, 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 this three weightage. So going forward, what does it tell me? It tells me, perhaps, that the last decade was not lost, but was a cruel reminder that the, the hopes and aspirations that our growth process gave us over the first 20 years uh, now need to be rekindled. And that, in my view, again, final message reading the book, because your book starts at a very interesting place. Uh, I have elsewhere written a schematic depiction of the Indian economy. And I said, whatever it was, you could identify, my part of my thesis was on this, an objective for national economic policy whether it was modernization and self-reliance under Nehru, Garibi Hatao under Mrs. Gandhi, the missions under Rajiv Gandhi, economic liberalization under Narsimha Rao and Vajpayee, and then, if you like, to be cruel, sort of Vajpayee to UPA 1, uh, you know, a rights-based approach to development. Ek vichar tha. 2008 onwards, it was vichar free, crisis management, and thereafter. Uh, if my thesis here is correct, then what this book chronicles, in a sense, is the end of economic ideology and an attempt to replace that with what I would call efficient economic management, resulting in efficient service delivery, topped with efficient macroeconomic management. Uh, if that is so, then looking forward, the book sends us a dire message. Because if this were to be the case, and Nitin and I are collectively right, and many other economists are right, that essentially we have a problem that is structural in nature, and this will require certain difficult political and therefore, and therefore ideological choices to be made. And those choices can only be made with a part by, by a party or a movement that is able to commit political and ideological capital into those choices. It cannot happen at the central state level alone. There has to be some sort of consensus. Uh, but business as usual is reflected in this book of attempts to be efficient to manage an economy without any idea about what you're doing other than what I would call broad stabilization policy and a hope that that itself will bring out growth uh, will not be the case. We will need to go back to NDA 1, we will need to go back to Narsimha Rao's uh, period to rekindle the kinds of shift in demand composition we will need to bring about economic growth. And in that sense, therefore, this is, I think, uh, very, very hard-headed uh, and therefore multidimensional chronicle of the times that, I must be honest, I didn't live here then you all lived through, which seemed to be pretty good times, till uh, the book was published. Thank you. Thank you, um, So, yeah, now, um, actually, bring that mic between us. So, um, thank you both, Mr. Desai and Ratin, for your con comments. Um, so, I'm just gonna ask Pooja about 15, 20 minutes worth of questions to elaborate on the book a little bit. And then I'll open it up um, to any of you who have managed to read the book so far or have general questions about macro and all of this generally. Um, I guess the, let's start at the financial, global financial crisis, right? So um, 
in some senses, we, we had this narrative back then that we weathered it pretty well, right? That like it didn't hit India too hard, that India didn't have the same kind of major downturn that a lot of developed economies did. But clearly there were kind of more structural issues which have had a long shadow. Um, what were some of these in, in, in your opinion and how have they affected this kind of lost decade of the last 10 years? Right, first, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to Yamni's uh, not here yet, but thanks to her. Thanks to Mr. Desai and uh, Dr. Roy for making it and uh, for saying what he has. I'm embarrassed. Uh, about your question, um, uh, Rohit, the, the structural issues, I think, uh, so if you read the first chapter of the book, uh, what uh, both Mr. Desai and Dr. Roy have described right now about the structural issues, there's a small subsection that briefly mentions about the changes that were underway before the global financial crisis hits us. And I think those changes uh, were taking place for the better. Uh, Ratan says that you know uh, the finance ministry and the government looks at themselves as uh, key, um, uh, you know, uh, determinants of the uh, economy, not as just one large player in the economy, in a market economy, but uh, it wasn't so uh, rotten in, in the lead to the 2008 crisis because, you know, a lot of the narrative and a lot of the things that were happening in the economy was, you know, uh, not just Tata's going and buying chorus, but even small, uh, you know, medium-sized companies going and buying uh, assets and factories and, uh, you know, in, in Europe, etc. And uh, there was a lot of um, migration from the rural areas uh, to the urban areas, and I think this was just before uh, uh, Narega uh, was uh, passed. And uh, people were finding jobs in uh, urban areas, and at that point in time, there were a lot of things that needed to be done to make sure that these structural changes that were taking place, uh, you know, uh, would be uh, would would be sustained in a way which would be good for the economy. I think what complicated matters is that the attention was diverted to crisis management and. Uh, you know, that attention for 10 years, we've not been able to take it away. In 2014, uh, it, was, it was expected that some of that work will begin to take place, but, you know, clearly it's not happened. And there's this long list of agenda uh, that needed to be done, which was created by Dr. Arvind Birmani, and it's there in the economic survey of that year, uh, where, you know, uh, how to deal with urbanization, uh, water resources, and a whole long list of things. Uh, most of that agenda lies, uh, you know, not attended to. And um, I think, uh, you know, uh, so, so that's probably, you know, one of the things why things turned out the way they did, that uh, the, the um, exports were doing well, like uh, Mr. Desai show, uh, showed in his graph. Um, today, uh, you know, uh, a, the government doesn't say so, but a lot of associated groups say that we need um, an Indian model, uh, you know, an Indian uh, economics, um, fine. But uh, look at the textile uh, sector. After agriculture, that's the second largest employer. Uh, what is your Indian model doing for that sector? That's, that, that sector's not doing well. Um, so I think um, probably, Till um, 2017, uh, the the attention was on crisis management, and then you know one or two big themes of uh, doing IBC and doing GST and demonetization without any well connected or well structured plan. And after that, I think it it's just a drift. You know, it's just <coughs> managing narrative. Uh, that I think is what has happened. There's this really nice kind of theme that runs throughout your book about the uneasy relationship between economic expertise and the political class, right? There's this really nice story about <coughs> Arvind Birmani, who's stationed at the IMF in DC and flies back to meet Pranav Mukherjee. And basically, as we're telling him, we need to focus on the FISC, we need to focus on the FISC. He doesn't even manage to meet him. He flew back specifically. To, and, I mean, that's kind of symbolic of like, yeah, people worry about it later. This is not something we super so, in some senses, politicians have always had problems with economic expertise, right? This is not a new thing. Um, 
has something changed in the last 10 years in the sense that are our technocrats not great communicators anymore? Are the politicians more hard-headed? I mean, is, is there something special or is this just the stakes are bigger every time and so we fall harder every time? I think the sense that I get is that uh, Indian political politicians uh, uh, don't want a crisis situation in the economy. And that's the only time when they fear there's going to be a crisis, that's the only time they begin to listen. Uh, more recently, we are not even seeing that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, nobody wants to be in a 1991 situation anymore. So, you know, when they feel that there's going to be some sort of a de uh, uh, macroeconomic crisis, they begin to listen. Uh, that's what happened 2000, in 2008. Uh, the, the experts got a free hand. Uh, one of the uh, people who were probably involved, we have uh, here, uh, Dr. Krishnan, uh, and um, I, there's a there's a um, uh, anecdote in the book where he he goes with his minister to the prime minister's office, and you know what he says is what happens. But uh, soon after that, it doesn't happen. And, and the anecdote on um, uh, Dr. Arvind Vilmani, so how it happened is that he met the uh, finance minister, Pr Pranam Mukherjee, and he said, these are the things we need to do. So Pranam Mukherjee tells him that, no, we'll do it in the budget. You know, right now, you know, hold on, hold your horses. Come back and tell me just before budget. He comes from Washington. He doesn't get a meeting. The, the finance minister's office doesn't give him time to meet the finance minister. So, uh, so yeah, so because by then, you know, the crisis is not knocking at your door anymore and, you know, you've had a small recovery, uh, uh, so there's overconfidence, we manage things really well, we are not affected like the rest of the world is, so we don't need to listen to experts anymore. And uh, uh, people think that, you know, the, the UPA2 government was not, uh, was more, uh, would listen more to experts, uh, probably because of who the Prime Minister was, probably because of who the Planning Commission Deputy Chairman was, but uh, as many anecdotes in the book bring out, it's just that, um, you know, they would be given, they would be, they would be heard and uh, nobody was quitting and going away, but uh, really, uh, other than the crisis management, how much of what they said was being implemented? So the only difference between then and now is that the relationship is not as tense uh, and not as probably, um, you know, <laughs> almost getting toxic, uh, but, but uh, they didn't listen and this government doesn't listen, so it's just been a slide. It's not that different. So um, one of the interesting things in your book is that you obviously talk about various finance ministers. and. Um, I mean, uh, it, it is no secret that one of the people who is kind of the main villain in this book tends to be Pranam Mukherjee. Um, I, I think that there have been observations that perhaps you have taken it a little lighter on other people. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, so, in the te so this is a book not in finance ministers, but it examines the 10 years. And in those 10 years, uh, so we have, we've had three finance ministers. Arun Jaitley's had the longest uh, <coughs> tenure of almost five years. <coughs> La, uh, later part of it, he was quite unwell and in and out of office, and uh, you know, Piyush Goyal was the minister. After that is Pranam Mukherjee, three and a half years, and then uh, Peter Damram for 18 months. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when I describe what happens uh, you know, in this decade, uh, I think that the one person who is actually responsible for a lot of what has happened is Pranam Mukherjee. And therefore, you know, the focus on him, and uh, the things that he did, and the things that he didn't, didn't do. Uh, Could you give a few examples? So uh, he took a decision when the Prime Minister was indisposed to uh, administer a third stimulus package. Um, we, are, he didn't, we know that he did not take cabinet approval. Uh, he seems to have taken that decision on his own. We don't even know if he informed the Prime Minister about it or not because the Prime Minister was indisposed, recovering from a, a you know, surgery. And uh, um, most analysts uh, across the board agree that that stimulus package was not necessary and partly responsible for you know, the macroeconomic instability, the phase uh, that led India to be called as one of the fragile five. Um, there is a phase in the book where I describe how he's not even on talking terms with the Prime Minister and they're communicating with each other through messengers. Uh, uh, they need to appoint uh, RBI governor. The, the uh, term of the uh, RBI governor is coming to an end, uh, and files are not moving between the prime minister's office and the finance minister's office. So, uh, compared to that, if I look at what Arun Jaitley did for five years, uh, you know, most of for most of his tenure, the trajectory is 
in a slight improvement. Uh, same for Pichadamram. It is during Pichadamram's tenure of 18 months that you know the fiscal deficit begins to you know get corrected, compressed a bit. Same for current account deficit. Uh, and he, you know, I spoke to him about this, and he himself says he takes responsibility, and he says I had 18 months, I could not control inflation, I could only compress the fiscal deficit, the uh, current account deficit, and we had to because of that we had to sacrifice growth, and we paid a price for it at the elections. So I'm not, you know, uh, that that's one of the main reasons, you know, I, I zero in on Pranam Mukherjee, and I, I wouldn't, I don't think I've been harsh on him. Uh, as far as Arun Jaitley is concerned, um, there is, towards the end of the book, a conversation with him in which uh, it comes out, I think, quite clearly that he's, um, you know, he's not really in charge. Uh, uh, everything is happening in the Prime Minister's office. And when I ask him, you know, what is Modinomics, uh, I do not even get a clear answer for that. Uh, and what he says, you know, the government is doing or plans to do, uh, is insufficient. So yes, I don't say that you know uh, um, he was uh, not uh, you know good or bad or whatever. But I think that conversation makes it quite clear that you know the real decision making is happening elsewhere. Also because um, uh, as I say that you know in finance ministry he's sending a lot of pro proposals to the prime minister's office. There's a presentation made on what needs to be done with banks, what needs to be done with NPAs, which is absolutely crucial at that point in time. But everything is getting rejected. So, uh, you know, that's what it is for the three finance ministers. Fair enough. Um, so, following up on that, I think there's a lot of permutations of ministers of finance and RBI governors that you cover over the course of this book. Um, which of these do you think were the most functional? In some senses, which was the best relationship which actually accomplished any of the goals that they had? In some senses, towards the end, it obviously sours a little bit, and now it's of a different sort altogether. But I mean, you've covered, or even not in this book, in the last 20 years of your economic journalism, like when has that relationship been most functional and productive, and why? Uh, I think um, Raghuram Rajan and P. Chidambaram had a very good equation. Probably because, you know, it was for a very short while. Uh, I think P. Chidambaram begins very well with Bhai Reddy, but then, you know, he begins to sort of assert himself, and they have differences. Um, they're both uh, people with a mind of their own. Uh, and, um, but in my book, at least, I think, you know, purely because of the crisis situation, they're both dependent on each other, uh, and it's a short period of time, so there's in, there isn't enough time for them to, you know, begin to disagree with themselves. They two, both the two of them have a good relationship. Also, um, to introduce the Prime Ministers, I think, in the beginning, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi has a good relationship with Raghuram Rajan. He even praises him a lot at the 80th uh, 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 set up uh, anniversary of the RBI. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh has good relations with everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, Governor Subara says that, you know, he's again and again going and telling Prime Minister Manmohan Singh that, you know, you need to tell the Prime Minister, Finance Minister to do this. Uh, you know, he needs to do this, and you know, I'm not able to do my monetary policy because this is not happening at the end of the government. And uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh listens to him very patiently, and he says, "Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, we need to do this, but you have to sort this out with the finance minister yourself." And you know, that's how the conversation ends. So he has a good relationship, but I'm not sure how much that helps. You know, the economy. Um, I think one thing I, I I didn't see as much about him in your book, but I wonder if this was even considered in a realistic way over the last 10 years was kind of, in some ways, giving up some control over the banks, right? So one of the conversations we're seeing increasingly right now is either we take banks below 50% or privatize some of them or these kinds of things. Um, it seems like since liberalization, every government that's come to power has made some kind of overtures towards disinvestment and privatization. And then they come to power and then they realize that, oh, we actually like controlling these things. Um, over the last 10 years, during all of this crisis management, was that ever seriously considered? I know FSLRC had some stuff about this, but it never really happened. Was this something which was ever considered? Uh, in the book, uh, uh, there are two subsections. One in which finance secretary and at that point in time in charge of banks, you know what Dr. Manmohan Singh had done, drawing from his experience of when he was economic affairs secretary, he merged merges the positions in the Ministry of the Banking Secretary and the Economic Affairs Secretary because he believes 
that you know, uh, uh, banking is the lifeblood of an economy, and you should not see them separately. And you know, it, it, one single uh, um, official should should look at uh, it for more coherent, coherent policy, and especially after the global financial crisis. So, uh, so he's chosen, uh, you know, individual to do this, uh, uh, Mr. Ashok Chavla. Uh, he initiates a conversation with the public sector banks, and to begin with, the first step is only about which all banks can be consolidated, where it makes sense to do it. Uh, it's not even go taking it to, you know, disinvestment or privatization, and he gets summoned uh, to the finance minister's office, and he's told to stop right there. And after that, at a meeting at the cabinet secretariat, he happens to find out that that position is being taken away from him and a new banking sector secretary is being appointed. Uh, so uh, the prime minister's decision is sort of reversed. Um, the second time this comes up is when um, financial services secretary, later on they started calling the position financial services secretary, um, Hasmuk Adya, who's, work, who's Gujarat Kader, he's worked for many years with Narendra Modi, and he uh, makes a presentation to Prime Minister Narendra Modi on uh, privatization is one of the things uh, uh, he proposes, and you know all the different banks need you know different uh, policy um, uh, treatment, and one of the things he says is the privatization for certain banks, and uh, Prime Minister listens to him very patiently and all that, but uh, till today nothing has come out of that. So uh, you're right that. Um, uh, a lot is said, uh, you know, when uh, when political parties are not in office. But the minute political parties are in office, they realize that banks are major instruments for them to do politics, uh, and uh, they don't want to give up control. Can you comment a little bit just about kind of how you cover demonetization in the book? Because I think that's one of the things which is always a hot topic, um, and I mean. In, in some senses, you have this kind of question mark about did Urjit resist or something like that. Uh, I mean, was there any resistance from the internal bureaucracy, or was this one of those things where you had enough or take So I have to confess that I really do not know anything about demonetization more than there is in the public domain, and I uh, tried my level best to uh, speak with all of the uh, you know uh, main people involved in that. Uh, decision and implementation. I know all of them very well, but everybody refused to even say a word in it. And a couple of them said they will write their own books at some point in time. <laughs> and uh, so, spooked. yeah. Uh, or maybe they were just trying to avoid talking about it because it is really, uh, you know, a very sensitive mm. subject. If you've noticed, uh, Prime Minister Modi does not use the word anymore. Uh, the party president does not use the word, uh, now the home minister does not, they don't use the word anymore. The finance minister does not speak of it anymore. So, um, uh, so yeah, so what I say is that I, uh, I say that, you know, I reproduce what uh, Raghuram Rajan has said in his book, uh, which is that uh, much before it was announced, at a public gathering, he was asked about it, if, if demonetization should be done, and the question describes it exactly like how it was implemented. And uh, he publicly says that it was not a good idea, it would not achieve what um, you know, the intention, the question suggests. Uh, after which he is orally questioned about it by the Prime Minister, and he orally in explains to the Prime Minister at length how you know, it will not work out uh, it will not achieve the intended goals, and but still, if it if the prime minister thinks it needs to be done, uh, then you know some preparation will be required. And the same thing is uh, uh, the RBI uh, concerned deputy governor makes a note on it uh, and is sent to the government in writing. Uh, the board discusses it for barely you know a couple of minutes. Uh, they don't ask any questions. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, uh, the same day uh, the cabinet approves it, uh, even though no cabinet note has been circulated, they find out about it only sitting in the cabinet meeting, and in a couple of hours later it's, it's announced. And then I describe what all happens, um, uh, the chaos, the, uh, the over-enthusiasm of the media to uh, say, suggest that it's a great idea. And um, after the book got published, uh, um, I have, I've managed to get some more uh, uh, information, and which is that the year of 
the demonetization. Uh, I guess because bank front desk was so uh, busy exchanging notes, they had to stop doing everything else that banks normally do, uh, part of which is credit disbursement. And um, the uh, annual returns for income tax filed by companies, all companies, an, an analysis of that by the income tax department shows that um, investments undertaken in that year by the corporate sector dropped from, if I now recall correctly, I've written about this in the Hindu, uh, I think they dropped from about 12% of GDP to 2%, something like that. 87% uh, drop. An 87% drop. So, um, also, uh, there was a story that I can add here, which was done in the Indian Express, which said uh, that the RBI board had, in fact, uh, put a note of caution and uh, concern in their approval. Uh, so, but um, what I do say in the book, but, uh, I, I speak to some uh, former governors who tell me that, you know, uh, it, would have, it would be very difficult for a governor to resist because it's a judgment call. He can only advise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, though Dr. Reddy has said that if he were the governor, he would have put, put his foot down and he would have resigned. So that's how I leave it at that. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, fair enough. I mean, that was a bit of a difficult question. Uh, and, and then finally, this is, this is not something you talk about in the book much, but um, one of the interesting things which you would hear at least with, uh, with the last government was that during the beginning of the government, a lot of the ministers were very chummy with the private sector. Right, openly going to conferences, talking to businessmen, and at some point there was something sent from top down saying like stop it. At some which point public appearances with businessmen stopped for a little bit of time. At which point the PMO had to start doing a lot of backroom conversations to make sure that that relationship with capital was maintained somehow. Um, the government's relationship with capital definitely seems to have deteriorated a little bit in the last few years. Uh, how do you think they can? improve that? How do they bring it back? How do they court them again? They've announced a tax rate cut on <laughs> corporate <laughs> profits. <laughs> Is that enough? Um, I don't know. I think what is what is the corporate sector interested in? They're interested in making money, right? And uh, from what Mr. Desai and uh, Ratan have explained to us, uh, they're not going to make money if people are not going to buy things. And nothing that the government is doing is uh, ensuring that people are going to have money in their pockets to be able to buy things. So on the face of it, uh, you know, depending on where you stand ideologically, some people would say that the government has very, is very chummy still with the corporate sector, even if we don't see it. Uh, many people would say that, uh, well, that's all just a facade, because if the corporate sector is not going to make money, uh, they're not going to be very happy with the government. Uh, I guess, you know, the, the, I, I would go with the second explanation and um, whatever very little interaction I have as an economy uh, journalist, I don't have that much interaction with corporate sector, but whatever little I do have, uh, people are not very happy, yeah. even after the corporate uh, tax rate cut. Yeah. Uh, 